Will and how might nature respond to our potential lab leak? I, want, I guess I don't know what is meant by nature here. You know, if we're talking about sort of wild nature or, um, or you know, we are, we are all part of nature. So well, do you want to yeah. take a crack at what might be meant here? There's a lot of things it could mean. We made an argument early on. I, I still think it's important. And actually, it's a counter argument to one of the things that Sam has recently said. Mm-hmm. He said he was quiet about the lab leak because what difference would it make? And we, we've we've argued often why it would make a difference. Right. One yes. reason is because if you've effectively used uh, gain of function, if you've used serial passaging, for example, to draw a virus in a direction that it had not already evolved, you've effectively put tension on a rubber band. And you should expect that when it encounters the world of phenomena, that it will be pulled in the other direction so you could predict where it was going to go. Now, that said, so for example, were it the case that a serial passage experiment had resulted in it surrendering the capacity to transmit outside because the serial passaging experiment took place inside um, and it got some characteristic for forgoing that tension, then you would expect it to return to the ability to transmit outside, right? That's one example of a way in which an experiment could have pulled it one way and then we would expect it to naturally fall back the other way, just the same way that if you... I could see the opposite argument, though. I mean, in in, in this case, I guess I, I had not before heard you describe this as like a rubber band, the selective force. Uh, the selective force could also be accelerating in some direction such that the, the virus now has a tendency to seek out more change in the same direction. Well, you could do that, too. You could be you could effectively solve a problem that the virus can't solve in nature. And right. in fact, we did that. If this no, is a lab sure leak, we did that. We did. So that, that feels like the more obvious way that we exerted selective pressure if we use gain of function to create this virus. Yeah, but if you think about it like... Um, the, the, the argument I made in my dissertation about the tension between dispersal and competitive uh, strength mm-hmm. and that effectively... In you, a maple tree. No, no, in, in, a, in, in things generally. So if you look at Hawaii... Right, that's what right? I'm saying. Like in, in anything, not right. specifically viruses, not to humans, to right. anything. What, yes. you should, what should you expect to, be, to, to characterize the creatures of Hawaii? they're all going to be excellent dispersers, at least the native ones, right? Mm -hmm. What does that mean about their competitive strength? They'll be feeble because the point is there's a trade-off between those for reasons I make an argument for, but Mm -hmm. never mind. So the point is you would expect- They're good at getting to places and having gotten there. Everything else is just as good at getting places and uh, has not been able to put resources to competition, competitive strength. Right. Yeah. So they will will have borrowed to get- dispersal, they will have borrowed from competitive strength and they will have reduced selection for competitive strength in a low diversity environment, which is a natural consequence of it being a remote island. Um, That said, if you solve a dispersal problem, if you take a mongoose to Hawaii, it's going to have a field day because Apparently. It's a very strong competitor, mm-hmm. right? And lots of things. So if Hawaii is mm-hmm. very vulnerable, unlike a, a mainland tropical habitat, Hawaii is very vulnerable to invasion because it has all these feeble competitors. Why are they feeble? Yeah. Because they're excellent dispersers. Yeah. If you overcome the dispersal uh, barrier, barrier, then, uh, then of course they're going to win. Right. So the implication is that we effectively solved, if this was a gain of function uh, escapee, we effectively solved a dispersal problem for the virus. So it didn't have to solve it. We gave it the keys to the human kingdom. And then having gotten in there, you would expect it to find its own equilibrium. Yeah, or, you know, potentially the keys to the, like the ACE2 kingdom. Right. right. Yeah. That said, we are, okay, so we solved the dispersal problem. You would expect it to naturalize into the human population. And then we have interfered with a novel kind of vaccine that is almost cartoonishly narrow in its yeah. evolutionary scope, and therefore we are now pushing the virus around. We have used the vaccine to interfere with, not we have interfered with the vaccine. Right. No, yeah. we have interfered mm-hmm. with the evolution of the virus after solving a dispersal problem. Assuming this was mm-hmm. a lab leak, which is an assumption, but yeah. a uh, more and more likely one, yeah. um, then we are now pushing it around evolutionarily. We're pushing the virus around evolutionarily so it won't find an equilibrium. It will move in response to our evolutionary pressure that we are exerting. Yep. Um, speaking of which, there's another question here. Trusting if SARS-CoV-2 makes the evolutionary leap to transmit outdoors, you will tell us. 
Um, yes. And, and and what we've said is, although we're not, you know, especially in our main podcast, we're spending a lot more time talking about the, you know, the broader ideas of the book rather than um, this particular moment in time that we find ourselves in with regard to COVID stuff. Um, we have said that we, you know, if, if things arise uh, that run counter to what we have said publicly, we will absolutely come, come back with that. And um, I still have not seen. So you have said that there are a couple of super spreader events that seem to have been at outdoor events, but it is of course possible um, that the way that they were effectively super spreader events was in like bathrooms. Right. Uh, and so, so, and that is the only, and I don't actually even know all I know my entire knowledge of this is from you. I have seen nothing, and it's not for lack of you know swimming in this literature a fair bit um, to suggest um, that there has been uh, anything like a change in terms of transmissibility, even in the Delta variant. Well, um, uh, it, re regard to outdoors versus indoors. Yeah. Yeah. So I believe we are beginning to see that. I don't think it's a strong pattern okay. yet, but it's a. I, what I have seen is not easily dismissed as it was a bathroom or something like that. That remains a possibility, but in one of these cases, it doesn't look likely. But I would also point out, it could be a natural consequence of the increased transmissibility, right? That the idea is, if you take the model that we were developing uh, a year ago, mm -hmm. right, where basically you've got a space, it has a volume, it saturates at some rate, yeah. um, you are not likely to be infected if you're healthy and you're in the space for a short period of time. Um, but if it's saturated, you'll get it. Right. And then the so point is- So you need is, 100 units with the original variant and now you need 50. Right. Yeah. So, so the point is, it, can you conceive of an outdoor space that saturates like an indoor space? Maybe not with the original variant and maybe you can with something that's much more transmissible. Yep. So- um, you know, something like that. That's how my model is that cautiously makes sense. changing. No, that makes that that makes some sense. Yep.